Well, we're live now. Um, so want to thank anybody that's tuning in. We're going to give it a little while to, to really get going here because we want some people to, to uh, sign in. But uh, for those that are watching already, welcome back to Offshore Week here at Anglers. And so I'm joined with a bunch of guests today. This is kind of the big hurrah where we've been working up to all week with this live panel. So um, I want to thank everybody that's joining us um, to just do a brief, brief recap of the week. Um, so I wanted to thank uh, Captain Chris Springle, uh, Shimano Pro Staff, who's up north uh, for his Shimano video. That was a really fun time. Um, we had Jeremy uh, Blunt and uh, Bobby Layton uh, come in and do a bait rigging video. Jeremy's with us today. I want to thank Bobby for joining us earlier in the week. Um, and then we also had Brandon Carter with Fathom Offshore. Big thank you to those guys for helping out. Uh, we also had, um, let's see, who else did we have? We had uh, Mike Frigi and Tony Frigi with the hammer down, talk about swordfish. That was a lot of fun. Uh, let's see, who am I forgetting? Oh, thank you, Lenny, for helping out with uh, the bottom fishing video. So um, we had a great time doing it, and uh, the videos are online, so you guys can definitely go online and watch those whenever you want. They're going to be on our website, Facebook, Instagram, all that fun stuff. So, um, but today, we're really excited. Uh, we are joined by all these guys that uh, fish out Ocean City. Uh, we've got some charter boat captains, private boat guys with us. So I wanted to do some quick introductions. Uh, so we will start with um, who I have here. We've got Curtis Campbell. So Curtis, uh, you're on the uh, real estate. So uh, just give us a little brief history of what you do. Yep, uh, we're a completely recreational boat. Um, fish a lot of corn inside Ocean City. Uh, it's a 42 foot uh, custom Richie Howe express boat. Um, it's a really nice platform for us. It's kind of a non-charter operation, and uh, we had a lot of fun with it. We, we we fish quite a bit. Nice, nice, absolutely. Yeah, definitely participate in the tournament scenes. So you absolutely. guys scales quite a bit, so yeah, uh, it's exciting. We've been fortunate. Nice. Yeah. Um, so we'll just do a, kind of go around here. So we have Chris Little, Chris, uh, with Talking Trash. So uh, welcome to the uh, to the panel here. Uh, just kind of give us a brief history of your uh, your vessel there. Uh, Fifty-eight so. Gillikin, Custom Carolina. I've uh, been, I've had it for six seasons now, and we fish out of the fishing center at Ocean City. Nice, nice. All right. Uh, let's drop down here to the bottom panel. So, Jeremy and uh, Mark, let's start with Jeremy. Go ahead, uh, Jeremy Blunt with Wrecker Sport Fishing. Good morning, guys. Pat and Jeremy here. Yeah, with Wrecker's a 57 foot Carolina boat. Um, fish out of the fishing center also. My ninth year on the boat. I think it'll be my 24th year doing this crazy stuff as a job. All right. This is the job. This is the job. <laughs> Good morning, Captain Mark Hoos from the Charter Boat Marley at Ocean City, Maryland. We're docked at Sunset Marina. Uh, I've been on the boat since the boat started, 2004. Nice. Good morning to everyone. All right. And lastly, we got Jeremy. Uh, I'm sorry, Jason. Jason Norton with uh, uh, Killing Time, I believe, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, Killing Time. It's a 52 foot Carolina boat. Um, I've been on the boat for about five years now, and we also fish out of Ocean City. All righty. So welcome, guys. Um, thank you guys for helping out. So we're going to kind of just do like a, a basic offshore of the mid-Atlantic kind of talk about uh, tuna, marlin, wahoo, uh, mahi, all the basic stuff. So, um, you know, it's a small boat offshore seminar, and you guys obviously fish a lot on bigger boats. You're on a smaller boat, um, but we've all fished on small boats. We've all had that challenge of space and you know not being able to run big giant spreads but you still can on a lot of these smaller boats so um let's start with with some basic stuff that you would prepare for going out so when you guys are getting ready to prepare to go out for a trip regardless of what you're going after what are the kind of preparations that you're making what are you guys looking for as far as like water temperatures and like finding where to go and like what what's the plan let's start with um Let's start with Jeremy. Yeah, I follow Mark. <laughs> he and I work together a lot in the spring. <laughs> Jeremy sleeps in. Yeah, I'm sleeping in. Mark's already there. Yeah. Um, I use the Rutgers um, app website on my phone. It's easy. It's free. That's a good idea just what's going on out there, uh, especially here at the spring coming. So if you see something peeling off the Gulf Stream, you know, look at it every day. I think when it gets within range, you know, basically have to be, be prepared to go. Then we have the Sirius on the boat, so that gives us a live 
quarter temperature, um, so it gets us in the neighborhood, we say, um, to find that, that temperature break. Uh, Mark and I fished last year all day down in Norfolk, never found anything but to 3.30, but once we found it, it was on. So quarter temperature is the key in the springtime. <clears throat> okay. Traditionally, the, the bigger the uh, temperature break, the better the fishing is traditionally in that early season. It, okay. it, it sucks in the bait is what happens. So and, and the bait's there, the fish are there. So let's talk about the season. So for, for you guys, I mean, we, we all fish in the same area. Let's talk about the season. When do I expect to see what? So let's start in the beginning of the season. What shows up first? Um, let's see. Chris, why don't you take this one for the, for the lead? I mean, a lot of times it's the home run hitters early in the season. You can, uh, I mean, catch them as early as probably March into April. It all depends, you know, like Jeremy said, if the if you get a piece of water that breaks off, there could be some blue fins in it, some yellow fins. I know last year one day we went out early and, I don't know, it was like 75 miles and sat down, put the lines in, three blue fins right out the bat, uh, picked up, ran nine more miles out, sat down, and ended up started catching yellow fins. It's it's, it's tough at the beginning of the season. I mean, you're hero or zero sometimes. Well, and I think, you, like you said, in the beginning of the season, we're still looking for that warmer water to come in. So we are making a little bit farther runs, which can be a little challenging for the smaller guys. Um, so as the summer wears on, the water temperatures warm up. Curtis, so like when so Tunis kind of shows up first, you're a big marlin guy. When do you start seeing some of those marlin show up in good numbers? You, you'll, you'll have – Spotty ones here and there, if, particularly if you get a little piece of water that breaks off, you might get a shot at one. A lot of guys will go, you know, talk about hero or zero. They'll go and try to catch that first one out of Ocean City, which is always a big deal. But um, we won't really start focusing on trying to catch billfish until probably Keeney kickoff, which is Fourth of July weekend. That's when we start to see a little bit better, more, more shots at, at, at billfish uh, in in that water. Okay. All right. Um. So let's talk about um, – um, <laughs> uh, No, so um, let's talk – we got a couple of questions here we can jump off of while I'm thinking of something else. So we have Dave who wrote in, how does the moon phase affect tuna fishing, and what is the desired moon phase if it is effective? Anybody want to – let's see. Uh, Mark, you got any uh, – Feelings on moon phase for tuna? Seems like the full moon, a lot of times it's tough, you know, during the day. It seems like uh, the, the action is real good when the, uh, when the when the sun basically is coming up that first hour, maybe even less than that. It seems like they'll cooperate. But traditionally, it slows down. At least it's a good excuse for us to say why it is slowing down because of the moon phase. But traditionally, you will find <laughs> that, that it's a little slower during the day. They seem to feed a little better at night during that full moon. And definitely difference. I don't want to say we don't have any good days that's during the moon phase of full moon, but it but it does play an impact at times. At least it feels like it does as far as the uh, scenario. Seems like a nice dark night. You know, they seem the bite better, better when the sun comes up and during the day. But when you get a bright night, full moon, it seems like the uh, first thing in the morning is it. And then it slows down a little bit. So... But again, it's not always the rule, but it sure seems to act that way at times. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's see, we got some other questions here. So let's talk about dredges real quick. We've got uh, Endon called in and wants to know he's running a 27 foot con uh, center console with twin engines. Um, he does not have a dredge boom or a downrigger. And he was just kind of to get some advice on running a dredge with a small boat. I think most of us have probably fished on boats that have, you know, the the dredge bar or running them off the riggers. Do you guys have any recommendations on running a, a dredge on a small boat where you're kind of limited on space? You got any like little tips for them, uh, for Evan? You really got to, you got to use a dredge boom. You can't really run them off the riggers on them smaller boats because they're not strong enough to hold them. Yeah. Yeah. When we, uh, before we, uh, got the 42 Express, we fished off a 28 Grady weight and, you know, very limited in space and capacity, didn't have any electronic rails or anything to uh, to haul up a, a dredge well. So we started with not, you know, like a Squid Nation dredge or a real mullet dredge is super heavy. You know, it's, it's almost too hard to pull in by hand. So um, we used um, strip teaser dredge and you can get that down and, and clean it off of a, uh, off of a, 
of a halyard cleat on the back of the boat. If if you're you know if you don't have any other way to do it, that's about the only way to, to really get it done because it, like Chris said, it'll pull your riggers right down. Yeah, and, and I agree. We want to you fish with a buddy on a smaller boat, and we did the same thing. We just kind of cleat it off like you said, one of those lighter strip tease dredges. Not the most ideal, but it'll work. Um, it's brought plenty of fish up there. Strip tease are Yeah, I mean it'll definitely work in the water. It's uh, you know I would I would recommend that you definitely invest in the in the or something. Kind of help get them spread out a little bit. Um, so let's talk about some spreads for tuna. So. What do you guys typically run in, in a basic spread for tuna? We're, we're talking about stir bars, you know, baits. Are, are we running naked baits? Are we putting skirts on them? What do you guys prefer? So, Jason, let's. Uh, what do you prefer fishing with uh, when you're chasing tuna? What's your basic spread? Um, I typically like, you know, seven or eight ballyhoos with, with skirts and then, you know, two or three spreader bars, sometimes a couple daisy chains, you know, just, uh, you know, plastic baits, just stuff like that. Okay. All right. You Chris, know, what, like what's sea, sea witches, sea witches, and you know, small islanders for your ballyhoos, and then you know, just spreader bars and. Okay. Are you pulling dredges when you're when you're fishing for tuna? Not usually. Every now and then I'll pull one, but typically no. So I know a lot of guys that do, but I, I do not. Okay. All right. Chris, what about you? What's what's a basic spread for you that's worked well? <laughs> Yeah, we run a lot of rods, so basically, if they make it, we're pulling it. <laughs> Usually, three to five spreader bars, a couple daisy chains. Yep. Um, we run like seventeen or eighteen rods at a time. So, wow. Basically, we got to mix out there. You know, obviously, I think every every fish in the ocean will eat a blue and white islander. So, if you don't have that out there, then you're at a disadvantage. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a popular one. Uh, Mark, what about you? You kind of concur with these guys you do anything differently oh no they're absolutely we're all on the, pretty much the same page uh it seems like earlier in the year you know when you're I, I like to pull a lot of plastic early in the year i can throw a little faster cover a lot more water uh if they seem to dominate the meat then i'll switch over i always do have the meat out there also and and we'll pull it but i let the fish dictate what's going to happen what they want for yep. the day yeah color wise you know bait wise one day catch more on plastic the next day you're catching more on meat it seems like when the water warms up some and we have to slow down a little bit you know we're not covering as much and we're working more areas that are you know, either a rip or bait or something like that some type of edge then then i may put more meat out but i'll let the fish dictate it i'll start out with a basic spread you know that we have daily and then you know we'll see i mean you get five bites on a spreader bar well then and no bites on anything else obviously you better put some more spreader bars out you get five bites on meat and and nothing on any type of chains or spreader bars then you better switch over and, and go to that route my famous you know saying is just what the charter say what do you like to fish huh? I like to fish what they bite on and just match the hatch. So, you know, one day they're eating small baits, the next day might be some larger squid there. It just really depends. But the ocean, you just need to learn to read it and then adapt. So how how much of your electronics are you guys using when you're offshore to help find bait? And like, what, what exactly are you looking for? For guys that are on these smaller boats, a lot of us are used to fishing in the bay and we, we rely heavily on finding, you know, pockets of, uh, of bait and whatnot to find the striped bass and all. So when I'm fishing offshore, how am I utilizing my electronics? Jeremy, why don't you start with that one? Um, I see it with the selling boats nowadays, you know, all the electronics, you got to have the chirp transducer. You know, if you're going to spend the money for to get offshore, you need the right electronics and it starts with that chirp transducer. Um, secondly, a lot of guys, when we're fishing early season, we're out deep, deep, thousand fathoms sometimes. And guys are like, well, I can't read bottom. Well, you're not going to read bottom. I only look at the top 200 250 feet once you get inshore say within 50 fathoms yes you want to look at the bottom but just worry about that top two 250. um if they're below that they're not going to come up and eat um and play with it you know it seems like some days the water quality makes your screen a little fuzzy and blurry then the next day it it's you know crystal clear and the water conditions do expect affect the fish finder um Get it dialed in. Some guys just fish it on auto. I like to play it fine on, on gains and scope and all that to, to get it dialed in right. Yeah. Like if, 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 on our boat, if you have the capacity to, to dual frequency, I'll, I'll set my low range at 600 feet and my high frequency at 300 feet. And that's that's all I'm watching. 
just like Jeremy said, I'm not, I don't think I can care about top, particularly if I'm, you know, I'm just looking for, for the being in that top 300 to 600 feet. All right. Okay. All right. All right. So while we're on the, the, the topic of uh, questions with the uh, electronics, we had Tim who chimed in. He's looking to mount a radar to his T-top and was curious if uh, we had any recommendations for the angle for reception while running. We don't really deal a lot with electronics, but um, do you guys have any suggestions on how to how to mount that for any uh, that kind of stuff? Matters on the hardtop design. Um, I'm familiar with the regulators and stuff that we sell, and they have a little notch in the hardtop so that when, it needs to be angled level while the boat's at speed is the main thing. Um, if it's level and the boat's sitting on the trailer, you got to think when you're up and running the bow is going to rise and you'll lose that first 50 or 100 yards in front of the boat. So sometimes you have to shim them so they're facing downward just a little bit um, when they're at the dock, but level when you're up and running. Okay. We, right. a, a few years ago, a few years ago, we got a new radar on the boat and, you know, we, we had to change our, the platform that it was on just for that reason. Um, you know, we weren't seeing as much as we should have been. And a simple leveling shim took care of the problem. Okay, all right, very cool. And uh, you know, Tim, if you're watching, um, you definitely want to reach out to some electronics guys that can help you with uh, choosing how to install that, or maybe even help you out with that. Since uh, you know, it's it's not really what we do here at Anglers, but uh, we're we're doing our best to help you out. So, um, so let's talk about. We have a question here. We, we talked about that kind of earlier season uh, tuna bite. Rick wants to know what's the best method for catching yellowfin in July. So season's kind of getting a little bit uh, worn on there. You guys, you so you changing tactics from the early early part of the season, moving towards July for yellowfin. Well, I'm catching marlin in July. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, easy answer. Uh, no, uh, I mean, yes, certainly. I mean, these these guys are going to be able to speak to that way more than I can. Um, they're out there every day trying to target those fish um we would definitely change over in july probably a little bit of a mixed bag for us trying to see if we can't catch a billfish here or there um and then probably we're switched over to almost all meat at, at, at this point in the season so mm -hmm. I, I, these guys are probably better speak to that yellow kind of question yeah chris what about you are you are you how are you changing tactics in july well like mark said more you know, as the water warms up, we definitely switch over to more ballyhoos. It seems like the, the tunas like the ballyhoos better when it gets warmer. And, I yeah. mean, last year, right after the tuna tournament, if you didn't have a flat of butterfish out, then you're wasting your time. It goes to chunking right after the tuna tournament last year. I mean, every year is different. And prior to the year before that, I don't think any fish were ever caught inshore chunking. Everything was caught offshore. So, I mean, every year it seems like something's a little bit different. So let's talk a little bit more about the, the chunk plate. So what are you guys typically looking for? I mean, obviously you guys work together a lot and you, you know, you're kind of exchanging information and that can be tough for the guys that are getting into it. What are we looking for other than hearing some, some muttering around the docks? What are we looking for to switch from trolling to the chunk bite? The inshore chunk bite. I mean, you're, you're basically mm -hmm. chunking off of structure, hot dog, hand bone, all depends. I mean, you, you know, sometimes everybody goes to the hot dog and, there'll be three or four boats at a different hump out there and they'll be crushing them. And when you get 70, 80, I mean, I know last year at one time, I think we got out there one morning and there was probably 300 boats within two miles. It was like the craziest shit Crazy. you would ever see. Crazy. And, and I mean, it's just, then they don't bite and everybody thinks they're not there. And we love Mondays as, as a charter boat captain. I tell everybody don't book Friday, Saturday, Sunday, book Monday. Okay. Everybody goes home on Sunday and Monday is always the day. Um, Mark, what about you? Are you, you changing things up? Please. Mark, what, what, are, you, are you in the same boat you you? For, for changing up when you're going to the chunk bite? We, we do. Normally what happens, it seems like the water warms up. Sometime uh, in normally July, it makes a big transition from offshore to inshore, meaning you're out in early season, normally over 100 fathoms. You know, when you start, you could be 100 – 50 fathoms, 100 fathoms, 500 fathoms, 1,000 fathoms. But traditionally, normally in some time in Ju uh, July, beginning of July, there's going to make a transition. It could be late June. It's all water temperature variant. You know, the more that water mixes inshore and offshore, the more the fish yeah. deep scatter out. That's why I say that early season, 
it's it's always good to uh, I don't know what happened there, but yeah. you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, that early season. That's why I say it's really you know imperative to find those real hard breaks. But as the summer warms up, the water blends, and when the water blends and, and seems like the temperature starts to uh, blend, there's not as much fluctuation. The, the fish seem to start going inshore. We'll be out offshore one day, meaning out over 100 fathoms, and we've been catching them every day, and all of a sudden we're not getting bit. And the next thing you know, someone's inshore, 50 fathoms, 40 fathoms, and they're catching fish. So the temperature's warming up. Once it seems like it gets in the upper 70s, you know, they'll, they'll quit biting that troll bite. And at that point, you know, you start seeing some bait uh, on some of the structure. The fish seem to start concentrating more on structure, as Chris said. Sand eels is the predominant bait out there that we see that time of the year. They'll get on the bottom and when the sun comes up, they'll seem to uh, just start to gravitate off the bottom. And it looks like cotton on your uh, screen is what it'll look like on your depth finder. And when you find that, that seems to be what holds the fish that time of the year. Now, if we could drift on them, that's great. We'll chunk to them. I mean, if we could still troll, we'll troll. But unfortunately, the more pressure you get and the more warmer the water gets, the more finicky the fish get. And at that point, you need to take the bait to them. And the problem is, like Chris was saying, on the weekends, you know, it's so many boats out there, it just shuts them down. And then once the pressure gets off them, they start their normal feeding pattern again. There's been days in the summer where, you know, there's been, like you said, a couple hundred boats out there. They catch a few fish in the morning and then nothing all day. And then as soon as the boats clear out, 5 o'clock in the evening, 6 o'clock, they start to bite again and they catch them real well. But unfortunately, on a charter boat, that we can't stay. But, you know, that does happen. So water temperature definitely dictates what time of the year and what you're going to be doing. Okay. Oh, Adam, and guys asked about electronics. Um, we all do it. We leave the fish finder on running out in the mornings and always have one screen on the bottom. And you know, we might be fishing the Baltimore, but you come by the hot dog there and you see that the sand deals like Mark talks about kind of put a mental note, hmm, might be something in there. So always have the your fish finder on the bottom as you're running out so you get a clear picture of what you know, basically what you're running over. And when we see that bait and we see the water temperature, a lot of times we'll see the whales in there. Somebody inevitably will go in there, be the, the proverbial hero or zero. Um, and once it happens, we all kind of jump shit and do it. Okay, cool. all right. So Jason, um, I want to talk, we've talked about you know, changing tactics with baits and, and different times of the year. Um, when you're tuna fishing, let's just, I mean, this is kind of basic stuff, but let's talk about rods and reels and then like how we're rigging them. So are you using all 50s, you using all 30s, a mixture of both? Like what, what kind of tackle are you typically using? Typically we're using a mixture of 50s and 80s. Okay. Um, you know, and just you know, tip wide on leaders and then, you know, just snap swivels for, you know, spreader bars and daisy chains, stuff like that. Okay. Uh, Jeremy, we, what, what about on the record? Are you guys typically running a, the similar spread? You guys change things up any? We're fifties and eighties also. Um, we have you know, eighties or designated spreader bar rods. We fish them a little heavier main line and heavier leader on the, on the eighties. Um, I traditionally get four rods upstairs. The long riggers are 80s. Uh, the center rods are 50s. Then downstairs, Bobby has all uh, 50s and 80s mixed in. Um, when you get covered up on them, you need to have you know the 80s or get them to the boat quicker than the 50s. Um, don't really screw with the 30s until more we get that mix August fishing where you never know. You get a white marlin, a tuna, and a wahoo at once. So you will kind of have the, what I call the kitchen sink out there um, with a mix of everything. <laughs> So, Chris, what about leader size for for yellowfin versus bluefin versus big eye? Like, when are you when are you changing your leaders for those species? What's like the range of leaders that you guys use in pound test wise? Uh, I mean, it's all. I mean, from setup start to finish, you can. I mean, you can catch big fish on a light leader. You just have to have your drags right. <clears throat> um, you know, early season. I mean, I think you can get away with heavier stuff. I, I mean. We usually run 120 pound fluoro um, on most of our stuff. And, you know, as the summer goes on, you might have to go down to 80. You just, you have to be careful. And I mean, from my experience, like when the blue fins get in there, sometimes like mid June, I've had a tough time. Like if we try to run 80 pound fluoro and you run them way back there, sometimes you get the bite and it'll break right off. Cause it's just, you got so much drag in the water and 
the, the lines are so far back there when you're trying to catch blue fins, it's, it's a little bit tougher to be a light leader with those. Okay. Mark, for, for you, what about leader length? Do you guys go with a particular leader length that you like? Does it change during the season at all? Are we using real long leaders, shorter leaders? What's the what's the approach there? Uh, on the leader, the fluorocarbon, you know, we like to keep it, <clears throat> excuse me, long so we have a wind on, nice wind on leader. As far as a preference in size, the longer the better because we're charter fishing and we can cut the ends off daily, recrimp, that type of thing. So really, it's really no, I guess, desired length on that. You know, you might have 30 feet on there. It could be 50 feet. A lot of the tour, some, well, I don't want to say a lot. Some of the tournaments, they, they eliminated the IGFA length on it, and they just went to an unlimited. So that really, you know, it's nice getting that one on leader on the spool. So it makes it a lot easier. So, I mean, it, the whole thing in charter fishing, just trying to, you know, maintain your, your equipment and, and, you know, get the most out of it. So the leader, if we can just keep cutting pieces off and the leader's not fatigued, that's great. Obviously, trolling, we can keep it a lot longer chunking. It, it'll get frayed up or it'll get coiled up, that type of stuff, get a lot of memory in it. We have to uh, definitely cut leaders off daily on that. And again, on the chunking, it's more of a critical factor at that point. Sometimes they are leader shy. You might have to reduce your leader, go down to 30 foot, you know, 40 foot. It just depends on the whole thing. So obviously having a wind on is, is critical when you're chunking. When you're trolling out there, it's nice to have a, a wind on. doesn't always have to be that way. It's a little easier on the mate if you have a, a, a longer arm mate, taller mate. The little short arm guys and stuff, they have a tough time, you know, with with long stuff when you have a snap swivel on it, so they got to keep wrapping it. But, you know, if it's a wind one, it's much easier. So really depending on the size of the whoever's in the cockpit is going to play a role into what you want on spreader bars and chains. When it's a wind one, it really doesn't matter. Okay. All right. Um, so um, what about chunking? So, you know, it's kind of like this industry known thing that you go down to like 30 pound fluorocarbon when you're chunking. How often are you guys going down that light? You start out a little bit heavier and if it's not working, then you switch. Like what's, what's the tactic for leaders on chunking? Pound test wise. I, I usually like to, to do, you know, start off with, you know, a couple 30 pounds, a couple 40 pounds and, you know, a 50 or 60 pounds just to kind of see where things are. Um, me personally, I'll, like you know, keep it 40 pounds if I can, but sometimes you have to go down to 30. Okay. Jeremy, what about you? Traditionally, when we're chunking, Bobby gets the light tough. You know, we try not to go below 40 on my boat, but he'll start with 40 and I'll, I'll start with as high as 60. And the one thing I noticed last summer, mm -hmm. once they start biting, I mean, you can get them eaten out of your hands. Don't be afraid to throw that 60 back out there. I mean, they'll eat the 40 right out of your hands. They get that frenzy. Throw that 60 out there, and man, it makes so much difference. Have that, that extra leader. Um, but some days you got to just go to 40. But I really hate going less than 40. <laughs> it's really, but if you can get I mean, them, some, day, some days you got to go to 30. Yeah, if you get them on 30, eating out of your hands, I'll be amazed. Throw that 60 out there. They're in such a frenzy. They'll they'll eat it too. All right. So well, we've talked about some leaders. Let's talk about, um, you know, wiring fish. When you get the fish close to the boat with those lighter leaders, are we changing tactics? Like, let's talk about, you know, with the heavier tackle. Um, and I apologize. We, we, we're having some connection issues with uh, with Chris. But uh, let's talk about, you know, handling the fish close to the boat. So we've, we've hooked them. We've got our gear. We've got our leader set up. We've got the bait on there. We've, we're bringing the fish close to the boat. Um, let's talk about kind of keeping things simple. We talked about wind ons that helps eliminate having a line laying around on the deck. Um, Jeremy, why don't you walk us through kind of the end game on the record when the fish is getting close to the boat? And I'd like to talk about the mate's perspective, but I'd also like to talk about the captain's perspective because boat handling can become a big, big point to this. Yeah, I see it for board. It's winter time. You're on YouTube. You're looking around and I watch other people's videos and they keep the boat going it and, eight seven knots like they're rock fishing they don't know to slow down you know, if you have an outboard boat you can simply pull it back to idle and the boat will maintain like a maybe two knots and that's the key that's what you do with the big boats you don't completely stop and you get to go forward at a slower pace um other common thing i see guys trying to calf a tuna with a three and four foot gap um, we use an eight foot gap 
all day, every day. Bobby has one gaff he'd sleep with. He loves the thing so much. You know, you get comfortable at that longer gaff and a longer reach. But basically, when we get the fish up, you know, I'm working the boat, keeping slowing it down, and I'm watching what he's doing. He's simply reaching out once the wind on comes on and starting to pull, and he can control the fish. Now, there's times, especially, you know, a big eye or something, we might dump that leader seven or eight times just because the fish comes up, circles, goes under the boat. He has to let go of it, and that's the whole thing to know when to let go. Um, well, in a typical 40-pound you know, yellowfin, he can kind of manhandle it. As he pulls, reaches down and grabs, we tell the charter to crank it to his hand. So he pulls up, they crank the rod to his hand, and he can pull all 25 feet in pretty, pretty quickly. Um, if he has to let go, he lets go. And for the boat size, I, we got an advantage. We can look down, but mainly just watch what the, the mate's doing. If he's struggling pulling on the fish, you know, slow the boat up or simply stop the boat, but don't let it get under the boat. Yeah. Yeah, we just, just like Jeremy said, as long as we got a little bit of forward motion, keep that momentum going, that way we find that it's a lot easier to manage a fish, particularly if it's a, a decent sized tuna or something like that. Uh, it's, it's also important to know because it's dangerous that the, your angler needs to be told to continue to wind on that slack to the, to the, to the point they can. Now, obviously, if the, if the uh, snap swivel is already to the tip, you can't do much about that. But um, hopefully there's not a lot of leader line on the deck. Uh, because if, if that mate has to dump that that leader, you know, it can get wrapped around an ankle or an arm or something like that. So that's dangerous. And, and we try to make sure that our anglers are constantly winding that line. Okay. All right. So, you know, the name of the game is to get as many fish as we can. When you get a fish hooked up, what's the deciding factor of keeping the baits out or starting to clear the spread so that we don't have to worry about angles with other stuff? Um, Mark, how do you tackle that? What's what's your deciding factor to chase after an individual fish versus keeping stuff out? Pretty much when you're going to run out of line. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it depends. It depends on your line, uh, your class of fish too. It really depends on the size of fish. For instance, if you're catching 25, 30 pound tunas, you know, for instance, a, a barely legal tuna, 27, 28 inch tuna. You know, you're talking 20 pound fish or, you know, money bear or less right there. But when you're getting a 30 pound class fish, that's a real nice charter size fish. You can you can stretch them out. I mean, depending on where they are, if they're scattered throughout the spread, you got some on your left side, some on your right. And everything seems to be going away from the boat. You can keep going, keep letting them pile on and, and, and capitalize on your your cover up at that point. If you're catching 70 pounds, 60, 70 pound yellowfin, these real big ones or larger blue fins or whatever it might be. You obviously cannot, you know, take and, and stretch them out as much unless they're cooperating. They seem to want to look like a torpedo going through the water and go across your spread. And unfortunately, if you start getting covered up and you get four, five, six, seven fish on, and that one you have one that goes across your spread, guess what? He's going to cut everything off. So you really need to. Okay. But my, my rule of thumb, honestly, I, I keep stretching them out till I, I start getting low on line. As long as they're still biting, you know, and it's not going to be a hindrance to what I already have hooked up. So it's just maximize your jump at that point and capitalize on the situation. We, for instance, we got hit two years ago mm -hmm. up in the Wilmington. We got covered up. Every rod went down and we had big eyes. Luckily, they were small big eyes. We ended up killing 13, you know, out of, out of I believe, 16 fish but they were smaller fish and they cooperated they went straight out the back but it could have been disastrous they could have you know started going side to side and then at that point you may not get any or just a few so it really again depends on the size of the fish and which direction they are going and honestly when you get hit is the boat in a turn when you get hit are you straight you know that plays a lot of factors in on what you're going to do okay um, so let's switch focus and talk about some of the other meat fish, um, you know, while we're out there uh, going after something like mahi so or, or dolphin. So, um, Chris, are you doing anything specific when you're targeting these? I mean, I think a lot of the time they tend to be somewhat of a bycatch. I mean, we get lucky when we catch one and just kind of put it in the box. But are you if you go out and you do you want to target them, how are you approaching that? Are you? Uh, if I was going to start, I mean, I really don't ever target mahi unless, you know, later season they get piled up on the balls out there and the gear and stuff and we run to that um and even like if you can get a big weed line i mean put some smaller baits out you know some smaller lures little chuggers or something i mean they'll they'll pretty much eat anything that's out there it just gets frustrating 
it's frustrating to me, just like on Marlin, when I'm trying to go tuna fishing, they screw your baits up. You got them big, you got your ballyhoos <laughs> out there, and they're whacking at them, tearing your shit up, and it's not fun. I got you. All right. I'm there, Curtis. Um, <laughs> <laughing. laughs> <them> my way. <laughs> Marlin or bycatch, unless it's a tournament. Yep. <laughs> it's a waste of bait. <laughs> Um, what about Wahoo? So, uh, Jason, I'll let you take this one. What What are you, are you changing in tactics for Wahoo? I mean, I know we hear about the guys down south doing high speed Wahoo trolling, and you know sometimes they're they're a bycatch as well. Are, are you doing anything if you wanted to try to target Wahoo? Jason, he's lost. What? Well, Say again? Because we we do something. Wahoo, too. Jason. How you catch Wahoos? <laughs> Oh, um, no, not really. Just why, you know, mainly pulling wire, um, you know, especially, especially down here, like in Charleston, um, you know, you're pretty much fishing the same spread. You're just implementing wire in your leaders. Okay. Yeah. We, uh, late in the season, sometimes if, you know, if it's a slow day offshore for, for Bill Fish or whatever, um, we'll do a, a long troll home LTH on the way in and, once we get into to shallower water, when it's late in the year, and we know the Wahoo are around, we'll, instead of uh, having our, our blue marlin plugs on the shore riggers, we'll just throw out um, basically two Wahoo weighted lures. And it's it's amazing how many bites you get on that. Not not even fast trolling. Okay. Like just going your normal trolling speed. So you can still kind of, maybe if there's marlin around, you, you might get, you still might get those bites. We've had blue marlin come up and eat those Wahoo lures. Um, but, um, it's, it's amazing how, how you can save a day if it's been a slow day mm -hmm. by coming in shore a little bit and, uh, putting out a, a, a little bit of a wine. Okay. Nice. So let's change focus. And, uh, we talked about most of the meat fish. Let's talk about Marlin. It's one of your specialties and you like going after white Marlin a lot, um, and blue Marlin as well. So we're, what kind of spread are you running for white Marlin? Does it differ from tuna? Is it, you know, like Explain, explain the spread. What are you doing? Uh, it, it differs dramatically. Um, one, um, from a gear perspective, we're using substantially smaller gear. Um, we'll troll with f basically four uh, 16 class, uh, what we call dink rods, um, with 30-pound um, leader, 60-pound um, wind-ons. Everything is, there's no uh, cramps. Everything's tied. Um, and then those will have um, naked ballyhoo. Occasionally, we'll run one skirted bait off of a, a, a long rigger. Um, I, I like to uh, take a rod up in the tower with me. I don't have a bridge like these guys, but um, I'll take a rod up to the tower and we'll run one, a, a fifth dink rod down the middle sometimes. And it's, it's shocking how many bites we get on that. Um, and then um, on the short riggers, we'll run two plugs, one on each side. Uh, and then, of course, we have teasers. Uh, which are squid chains and then uh, two dredges. Usually one's an artificial dredge and the other dredge is usually a, a valley, an all natural valley dredge. Um, trolling six and a half knots. If, it, if it's a really good bite, we might drop it down to five and a half. Um, um, so that's the gear. And then, um, well, I, you know, if we, if we get into, in, into a good bite, um, obviously, the goal is to try to catch as many of them as we possibly can. And the, and the best teaser for marlin fishing is a hooked, hooked one on, on the fish. So we're going to hopefully, if I can stay disciplined, which is incredibly difficult sometimes, um, because you want to catch that one. And so the first one's always tough. But um, if you can get that fish on and get into a turn, and hopefully you'll, you'll get another bite uh, once you're in that turn. So we're not pulling anything in. We're putting actually putting baits back out when we get a, a fish on the, on the line. Let's talk a little bit about pitch baits because it's a term that's used a lot. Um, how does this differ? Um, can you kind of explain like a pitch bait and how you would use that versus having your baits already in the water? Yeah. So typically we'll we'll keep uh, one more dink rod in reserve um, with the valley who already rigged on it. And then oftentimes, particularly if it's a tournament, we'll have one larger bait, either a horse valley who or a mackerel or something like that hooked up to like a stand up 30 pound or 50 pound outfit for pitching to a corner. Um, the, the, if hopefully my guys are all on a rod and they're using the rods that are already deployed out in the spread. Um, one of the things that you'll see some guys do is somebody will go and grab that pitch rod, but there's a, 
you know, the fish get confused when they're in the spread. If you, you throw too much out there, um, you're going to probably lose that fish. The, the, um, it's, it's a little um, counterintuitive. These guys, when they're tuna fishing, they want to have as much gear out in the water because that school tuna comes up. They're going to hopefully just pile onto everything. Marlin, they're going to come in. They're going to look at two or three different baits. If you're throwing more options out to them, it confuses them and they, they, they tend to go away. So if, if, if um, let's say you've, they've come up, they've hit your, your short rigger, or your, your uh, flat line, excuse me, and maybe you missed it or the bait's messed up or whatever, we'll get that in and then pitch out the, the pitch bait to the fish if he's still in the spray. Okay. All right. Um, so Mark, I mean, uh, old Mark, what about blue marlin? Are, are you doing anything different with blue marlin being a bigger species uh, over white marlin if you're going after billfish? Uh, most of the time, the blue marlin, I mean, oh, they're a whole lot of fun. Uh, I do like catching them. Uh, most of the time, I'm going to say probably at least 50% of the time, they just come in and pile on. You think it might be a tuna bite. You just don't know. It just comes in and bam, it eats your bait. And you hope he eats the right one. You obviously need heavier tackle. We do keep a pitch rod, as Curtis said. Uh, therefore, blue marlin, we'll, we'll keep it right on the side there and have it on an 80. And uh, that way, if you see them come up in the spread, all you want to do is try to keep your small stuff, your dink stuff, away from them. You don't want them eating that. Are you going to have a long day ahead of you? You could ask Chris about that one. <laughs> but uh, he had that happen last year. He was on one for a long time in the morning and ate the wrong thing. But no, as far as going out and targeting strictly blue marlin, doesn't happen a whole lot in Ocean City. Uh, was quite a few caught last year. The most we've ever caught, we caught three one day, and believe it or not, they were all on tuna lures, and uh, we were actually tuna fishing. So you never know when they're going to show up. It is nice when they do show up because they are.